with all of you a very happy Labor Day weekend, and uh, we look forward to sharing with you in worship. Happy Labor Day weekend. Oh, here we go again. And, uh, we look forward to sharing with you in worship. Happy well, good. Labor well, I'm repeating Day. myself. Go I'm going to go change my battery, so I'll be right there. Try it again. So we want to, uh, again, welcome all of you. And if you're watching online, we welcome you as well this morning. We're glad that um, you've joined us. And uh, again, we wish all of you a very happy, happy Labor Day as we get back into September and uh, the beginning of the school year and all those good things. So this morning, we're going to be celebrating communion. So if you're watching at home, you'll want to have your bread and juice ready uh, so that you can uh, share with us as we gather at the table. Uh, we're also finishing our a series on the seven deadly sins, and the last one this morning is lust, and so we'll be taking a look at that. And uh, I told Joe, no videos this morning, we don't need any, no, I'm just kidding. Um, and uh, we will be also, uh, over the next several weeks, this is the end of the, the summer series, we'll take a few weeks um, of just some, some sermons, and then we'll start a new series again uh, in October, and so we look forward to uh, sharing with you in that. Uh, but please uh, use this time to prepare your hearts. Oh, if you're, if you're new with us this morning, I should say, uh, we, we welcome you and are glad that you're, you're with us, uh, whether online or in person. Um, if it's in person, we invite you to fill out a visitor's card. And if it's online, uh, please let us know that you've joined us uh, in the comment section. And now use this time to prepare for worship as we share in the time of the prelude.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this opportunity once again that we have to join with brothers and sisters in your presence. We know that as we've gathered in your name that you are here, and so we are grateful for your Spirit's presence that will, that will speak to us, that will anoint us, that will send us into the world to do your work. And so we pray that you would be with us this hour and help us again to hear your message. Speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 101, From All That Dwell Below the Skies. We'll invite you to stand as we sing together. Take a moment to greet someone who's near you before you're seated. So for our brown bag this morning, we're going to be uh, using this time to do our backpack blessing. And so we want to invite uh, the children who are here to come and if they brought uh, their school supplies or backpacks to come on up. And also any teachers um, who may have brought some things, uh, come join us as well. Uh, we're going to be sharing in uh, this time together. As they're coming, if you're watching at home and uh, you're a teacher, or if you have um, a student who's home, uh, gather around. We'll be sharing this time together. Uh, so, what are you uh, most looking forward to uh, for the new school year? Seeing friends. Seeing friends. 
find out you know, what your teacher's like, maybe. Yeah. A good bus driver, yeah, that, that's important. <laughs> Have fun. Um, how about teachers? What are you guys looking forward to? Um, or not? <laughs> no. New subject, okay. I'm just going to say I'm looking forward to seeing all the kids get back together. Okay. I have everybody coming back together. Um, Miss Pam sent, uh, this is not my purse. I didn't, I'm not <laughs> accessorizing this morning. Um, this, is, this is actually Pam's, and uh, in here is her schedule. And so she, uh, she's not here this morning, um, but she wanted to be sure to send this over. So we're going to include this in um, the, the prayer as well. Uh, but uh, so there's a lot of things that we look forward to for school and a lot of um, opportunities. We have you know, new, new classmates, but it's also um, see old friends, meet new people, all those things. But it's also, it's also a little bit scary because it's the unknown, right? We're always, there's always a little bit of uneasiness and, and nervous about, you know, what if I don't have a good bus driver? What if I don't, you know, what if I don't like the people in my class? Or what if, what if people are mean to me? Or whatever it may be. Or um, what if my, my class, you know, gives me a hard time all year uh, as a teacher? So there's all kinds of things that we're not sure about. And so I thought it would be a good idea to um, begin the school year with, with prayer. Now, I know some schools have already started, but um, most are starting, I think, this week. Um, so, in your backpack, um, when you carry that to school, you're going to have pencils and pens and books and homework and those kinds of things. And sometimes it'll be, be full and sometimes it'll be not so full depending on, on the week. But besides those um, items, those you know, physical things that you carry, um, you also carry a lot back and forth to school too. Um, excitement and, and all the, the joy and all the good things that you'll, you'll have, but then also um, the stressful times when, when you have a lot of homework where um, you, you're not looking forward to a test or um, not looking forward to um, having to talk to parents if you're a teacher or, or whatever it may be that you have to do. And so there are all kinds of things that we, that experiences that we have in school, in the school year. And so we're going to just offer a prayer, um, blessing our, our school year, and uh, then we'll let you go back to your seat. So let's pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your love and your presence that is always with us. Today we lift to you these students and teachers who are here, uh, those who may be watching at home or wherever they may be, we just ask for your blessing. They're ready to receive your blessing and they commit themselves to learning and all the things that will happen this year ahead. And so we ask for your blessing on each one of them. We pray for, for a good year, for a great year, for fun and learning and new experiences and, um, and the opportunity to be a blessing to others. We pray for health and safety and um, just surround them with, with your protect, the protection of your spirit. We ask for your blessing on the backpacks. They'll hold the schoolwork and uh, they'll be carried back and forth from school. And as they carry these backpacks, may they be reminded of the love and care of this congregation that surrounds them each day. We give you thanks for our teachers and for our children and students, and we ask that you would help us, each of us, to be supportive and encouraging through the year. We pray for the teachers and administrators. We also ask that they would be sustained by your blessing. And may they be reminded, too, that this congregation embraces their call to teaching and supports them and encourages them as they share with their students. We ask that you would help us all throughout this year to love and care for each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thanks for bringing your school supplies. I hope everybody has a really great year, whether teaching or learning or uh, whatever it may be. So we're happy this morning to uh, be able to have, once again, special music. Um, Nancy Ryer is going to be sharing our special music. And the bulletin says uh, Doris Donat and Nancy Ryer. Uh, Doris is not um, feeling well. And so uh, we want to keep her in our prayers. But Nancy, we're glad that you're here. And uh, yeah. I'll fill you in a little bit about Doris.
divorced. She um, has had two weeks of not feeling good. And um, I took her to the emergency room on Friday. Uh, but I, luckily I called her yesterday and she's doing better. So that's what we can pray for. But just that's why she's not here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wing it. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy, and we look forward to, uh, after that offering of music, offering our gifts, and so the ushers come now to receive our gifts and offerings. Gracious God, we give you thanks once again that it is indeed because Jesus lives that we too have life, an abundant life, and a full, a full life, a life of your blessings. And so we ask that you would help us to be a blessing to others. We pray that you would bless these gifts that are offered, whether here today physically in person, or whether online, or uh, through the mail, or whoever it is that they've come. We're grateful, oh God, for the opportunity that we have to participate in your work. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please be seated. Our scripture lesson this morning, there are two of them. The first one is from 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 17. And the second one is from Matthew 5, verses 27 through 30. The first one in 2 Samuel is uh, the story of David and his struggle with lust. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out, to the king's, out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, You've just come home from a journey. Why do you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark, and the, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also and tomorrow, and I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. In the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to the word, sent it by hand. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter, he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. As Joab kept watch over the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant warriors. The men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite was killed as well. And then these words of Jesus from Matthew. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as we're finishing this series on the seven deadly sins, um, Hopefully, we've been able to take some time to, to think about the things that all of us from time to time struggle with without being too overbearing as it was for this uh, one young man who uh, was a student at Yale. And there was a visiting bishop who was there uh, speaking uh, to the freshman class on the dangers of worldliness to try to get them to be ready for their college experience. And he decided that he was going to use the letters of the university as his outline. And so he talked for 10 minutes on each of the letters of uh, the name of the school. Um, why he talked about youthful pleasures. Um, but as he looked out, he could tell that they weren't really too engaged with what he was saying. And so he, after 10 minutes on youthful um, pleasures, he, he moved on to A, which he talked about avarice. And again, he looked out and saw that they were, were not that enthused. And then as he got to L and began to talk about lust, he noticed that a bunch of them actually got up and began to walk out. And when he got to E, which was the last letter, he began to talk about envy. And by the end of his uh, 10 minutes on envy, he noticed that there was only one young man left in the audience. Everybody else had left. And so when, it was, when he was finished, uh, he walked over and saw that this young man was praying. And 
um, he's, the bishop said to the, to the young man, well, would you mind telling me um, what it is that, that moved you so deeply that you're, you're praying? And the student responded, well, yeah, of course, I was just offering a small thank you prayer that I decided to attend Yale and not go to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <laughs> Can't even say it. Let alone preach on every letter. Um, anyway, um, as we think about this morning, these two passages in scripture and uh, what it is that they say to us, um, most of you are, are familiar with Alexa, Amazon's Alexa. Some of you have Alexa. How many have people have an Alexa? Okay, so those of you who have one, you know, if, um, I'm sure you've probably seen it or seen it advertised, but it's a, a, an object that you can talk to, and you can ask it to do different things. You can ask it for the, the weather. Uh, you can ask it to play a song for you. You can ask it for a recipe. You can just ask it just about anything, and, and if, it, if she doesn't know what you're talking about, say I'm calling her she, if it doesn't know what you're talking about, uh, it tells you that, um, you know, I don't know what you're talking about, and so... Uh, What's happened is, it's interesting that this device that is really just a, a speaker that, that sits on um, your table or your, your coffee table or your end table or wherever, wherever you have it, um, and it's, it's linked to your, your computer. Um, one, one app developer actually said that uh, as he has been using his Amazon Alexa at home, that his toddler has now started talking to the coasters on the table and trying to get them to answer. And what that says is that we objectify things. Um, or we actually, in this case, we, we personify, personify something. Like we look at Alexa and say, hey, this, this thing is like a person. And the problem with lust is the opposite of that. Not that we personify a thing, but we objectify a person. Lust says that we have this problem of looking at people and seeing them only as objects <laughs> to satisfy a desire that we may have. Let's look for a moment at David, as he gives us a perfect example of that. David's problems began in the spring of the year. It says that it was when kings go out to battle. Now, notice already there's a problem because David is the king and he's decided he's not going to do what kings do. He's not going out to battle. He stays home and is lying around the house and that's kind of well, the, how this all begins. He's kind of idle and and home and everybody else out is out being occupied, the, the army's out and fighting, but he's, he's not doing his job. He's stayed at home. And he uh, sends his, his army out to lead against the, the Ammonites who are not such a friendly group of people. And so it would have been good for David to have done what he was supposed to do, but instead he stays home and it's late one afternoon and David gets up lazily and stretches from his nap and takes a walk on the roof and he looks out and he sees this young woman taking a bath. Beautiful woman taking a bath and he likes what he sees and so he sends for her and, uh, through, by a messenger and says, you know, who is this? Find out, find out more about her. And the messenger comes back and says, well, this is Bathsheba. Yes, yeah, she's a beautiful young lady and um, yes, you know, you noticed her and she's, she's local, but she's married. And her husband is Uriah the Hittite. So it's very clear, and all of that is that, that Bathsheba is off limits. She, David should have stayed far away from her and not had anything to do with her. Uh, she's the daughter of one of, not only is she married, but she's the daughter of one of David's biggest supporters and uh, married to a soldier. And David doesn't see any of those, those people as, as problems. He sees them as objects. I can deal with all of that. I want her. And so he sends for her, and she becomes pregnant. Now, although she's been treated by, like an object, uh, something to bring David pleasure and to just satisfy this, this need that he thinks he has, Bathsheba is clearly not an object. She's conceived a life. She's a wife, she's the daughter of someone, and now she's carrying a new life. But King David doesn't seem to be bothered by any of this. Instead, he continues, he says, okay, well, now I'm in this little bit of a predicament, so I'm going to objectify Uriah. Go send Uriah to me, and, and, and so David 
gets a hold of Uriah and talks to him and says, yeah, you're doing a great job, and um, why don't you go home and, and, and sleep with your wife? That's what wash your feet actually means, go home and get ready to, to, to sleep with your wife. And so he says, you know, go down, and, and he thinks, okay, this is going to cover everything because nobody's going to know whose child this is, except instead of going home, Uriah decides that he wants to be loyal to the army and to the soldiers who are fighting and to what he thinks is right, and he says, no, I'm not going to go home. Nobody else is going home. Why should I get to do that? I'm going to stay here and, and sleep at the gate. And so David says, oh, now he's caused me more problems, so I know I'll, I'll, I'll get him drunk and send him home, and definitely that will take care of it. And so David calls him in the next day and, and has him um, drink too much, and Uriah goes back to the gate again, doesn't go home. And so David now knows that he's in big trouble. And so instead of dealing with the sin of lust that, he's, that, that, that has happened, he decides he's going to take another step and he has Uriah murdered. Send him to the front line. Send him to the front line and don't just send him to the front line where the fighting is fierce, but then you know, when you get him there, back away from him so that he's there by himself. And sure enough, that's what happens and Uriah ends up being killed on the battlefield. David shows us in this story, in this story of scripture, that for one thing, he was a great king, but he was fully human. Dealing with the same struggles that, that we deal with from time to time and others have dealt with as well. David isn't alone. If you turn on the news, if you watch the news, you know of Harvey Weinstein or Matt Lauer or Kevin Spacey or Bill O'Reilly or Bill Clinton or most recently Matt Ariza, who has gotten into some, have all gotten into some kind of trouble because of lust not being able to control the desire, and so they go ahead and objectify men and women. And as we think about this ourselves, we've all at some time looked at someone as an object because we are sexual beings. That's what God created us to be. If you think back to the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, God created man and woman and gave them to each other and said that this was good. And that was how they were created, with that desire. But when that desire becomes something that objectifies someone else, that's when it slips into, into sin. God intended the gift of sexuality to be used to enhance relationships of commitment, of marriage, of, of, of our relationships. In that case, not to objectify people, which happens whenever there's lust, pornography, or promiscuity. And then Jesus adds to that challenge when he says, um, by the way, um, when you look at someone and objectify them, when you look at someone in your heart and see them as an object, an object of desire, well, you might as well just go ahead and, and, and do it. Now, that seems kind of harsh, but, but Jesus is actually making the point that sin begins with intent. And so if we objectify someone, whether we, whether we actually act on it or not, that's where the problem lies. Jesus wants us to know that it's better for us to lose a body part, he says, than it is to be cast into hell. And so he says, you know, be very seriously thinking about what it is and how it is that you live. Make sure you don't even think about it, because in thinking about it, you might be tempted to act on it. And so just, just cut it off before it even starts, he says. Don't objectify people. Don't even think about sinning. Now, that's very difficult to do because all of us are sinners. That's the whole purpose of this series, is to help us to understand that all of us are in the same boat dealing with these, not the biggies, but these seven deadly sins that all of us have dealt with from time to time. There's a short saying to help us to think about this, whether it's lust or any of these other ones uh, that, that we've talked about, and that is this, love people, not things, use things, not people. Love people, not things, use things, not people. How differently would the story of King David have, have ended if he had seen these people that he was dealing with as valuable people and treated them that way instead of as objects? A whole different outcome. He would have left Bathsheba alone, Uriah would still be alive, or at least not, if he was killed, it was not any fault of David's. 
Remember, love people, not things. See everyone around you as a precious child of God, made in the image of God. Respect them as daughters, as sons, as wives, as husbands, as mothers, as fathers, as loyal workers, as faithful fellow Christians. Love them as Christ loves them. Remembering that Jesus told us to love one another just as I have loved you. It is in living like Christ and loving like Christ that these seven deadly sins become less deadly. So as we conclude this series this morning on these seven deadly sins, um, what we are made aware of, as I've already kind of alluded to, is that all of us are sinners. We've all dealt with these things from time to time, whether it be anger or envy or lust or, or any of the things that we've talked about over these past seven weeks. That's why Jesus came to earth and gave his life on the cross, that we might be saved not because we stopped doing any of those things, but even while we were still doing those things, he came to die for us. That's what this meal is all about, this, this uh, communion that we celebrate, that while we were still sinners, Christ came to give his life for us. And Martin Luther said that that's one of the, the mysteries of, of, our li- of our lives is that we are both justified and sinner at the same time. And so I conclude with this statement from William Willimon, who wrote the book that the series was based on. He says, our sanctification isn't finished. God is still working on us, still transforming us, still holding up the mirror of truth to us and making us look at ourselves. We are yet learning to see ourselves as God sees us, mired in the muck of sin and yet destined by God to stand up and shine as the blessed children of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for, again, these weeks this summer that we've had to look at ourselves and think about who we are and the struggles that we deal with as humans. We're all too aware that, indeed, we are sinners, and yet, even in the midst of our sin, you sent Jesus to give his life for us, to show your love, and to offer us forgiveness and hope And so we ask that you would help us always to love as Christ loves. Not to see others as objects, but to see others as your children and to treat them as such. But most of all, we thank you that you offer us grace and mercy. And so as we come to this table, once again, remind us of how much you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. I would invite you to turn to page number 12 in the hymnals or watch uh, the words on the screen. Christ our Lord invites us to come to his table. He invites us to come as sinners, to come as those who have fallen short of what God intended, and yet, as he invites us to come as sinners, he welcomes us as his people, forgiven and justified. And so we invite you to come as you're led by the Spirit. And let us take some time now to prepare our hearts to come to the table using the prayer of confession uh, that's in your uh, hymnal, and then we'll follow that by a time of silence. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart, We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. This morning, our uh, communion offering is going to be used uh, for the, to support the work of the Camden Neighborhood Center. And so uh, as we remain seated and sing our um, communion hymn, which is number 298, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, 
uh, if you are prepared to give a communion offering uh, for the neighborhood center, the ushers will be coming uh, with the plates. So as we prepare to come to the table, we have uh, some prayer requests. There are no new ones in our book this morning, but from uh, the emails and website and different places, uh, we want to um, share these requests. First uh, is from Destiny Parker, um, who is Mark and Kathy's granddaughter. Uh, her boyfriend, Tim's grandfather, has been in the hospital for a couple of weeks, dealing with uh, numerous health concerns, so we want to keep uh, him in our prayers. Also, uh, Molly, the baby that we uh, prayed for that was a relative of the Bobsons that was born with the virus uh, is doing better. Uh, she is now off life support, uh, but is still in an incubator, uh, breathing on her own, but is not, it has come a long ways, but is still not out of the woods. And so we're gonna continue to keep uh, this baby Molly in our prayers. Um, Ken Stowe, uh, having surgery on Tuesday of this week. And then uh, for Pam's, um, uh, my Pam, Pam Batinger, uh, specify which Pam, uh, Aunt Ginny, uh, fell while she was attending a housewarming at uh, one of her grandson's houses. And uh, when she fell, she fractured her hip. And so uh, she's in her 80s, and they are um, trying to clear her for surgery today. And so uh, prayers for Pam's Aunt Ginny, um, who fractured her hip. So those are the requests that um, have come in, and uh, we will... Remember these as we share together in our great thanksgiving, which is on page 13. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. 
It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. You showed your love for us, and you called us your sons and daughters. And so as we come this morning, we lift up these requests for our brothers and sisters, your children, that have been shared this morning. We pray for... Tim, who is dealing with numerous issues and health concerns, and for this young baby Molly, who is still fighting for life. We pray for Ken facing surgery and for Ginny, who will be facing surgery as well. We lift up others who um, are in need of long-term prayer that we've been thinking of through the past weeks, who we keep on our list. We pray for, for Doris and ask that you would be with her and help to strengthen her. We ask that you would tend to each need of God represented by by our requests and by our thoughts and our prayers. Tend to them as only you're able and allow Jesus to work as their great physician. And remember, we remember Jesus, how on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and gave thanks to you and broke it and gave it to his friends and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves now in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. Pour out your Holy Spirit on those who are joining us at home. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence that we are the children of God, let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So I just remind you that as you uh, come to the table, we're going to invite you to come uh, by way of the center aisle. Uh, we're going to have uh, two stations uh, for us. So uh, Charlie um, and Pastor Joyce, if you would come, and Thomas, would you uh, be willing to come and assist us with communion? And uh, so we'll have two stations, and we invite you to come and take the, uh, the bread, either the regular uh, bread or the gluten-free bread. Um, just let us know if you need that. And then the cups, and then the trash cans are now at either end of the, the sanctuary for you to place them in um, as you come. We also remind you to, uh, that communion is open to all who would come to, to live in a new or deeper relationship with Jesus. We invite you to come to the table. And um, if you're watching at home, we invite you to uh, share and partake of your, your bread and juice as we share at the table here. Um, finally, just keep in your prayers as you wait to come to the table. Um, all the prayer requests, the new ones today, as well as the others that are on the back of the bulletin.
Our closing hymn, we have some uh, announcements. I hope that you'll read your bulletin. Um, there are a number of announcements in there. Um, please note in particular uh, the Eve Circle invitation, also the special invitation that uh, you may have received on your way in. Also the small group uh, prayer study at the home of Elder Barger, Barger will be beginning on September 14th. Uh, please make sure you make note of that announcements there as well as uh, the others. Um, our Family Promise Week is coming up. Uh, it will be uh, the 11th through the 17th. There is one family um, at the home in Swedesboro. And so if you would like to help support that ministry, please uh, see Lori Brooks, who is here. Also, he's a sign-up genius. Uh, but there are ways that we can still share uh, by dropping off meals or gift cards uh, or um, other needs that they may have. And so we continue to share in that ministry, even though it's different than it used to be. Uh, we are, are still continuing to support uh, the work of Family Promise. Also, um, the uh, youth uh, will be beginning on September 18th, as well as Sunday school will be starting on September 18th uh, for all ages, except for the JUGs who will be beginning next week. Um, so if you're in that class, know that you're going to start uh, next Sunday. Also, uh, the tr church council will meet this Tuesday night at 7.30 uh, for a special meeting to um, prepare for our church conference. And so don't forget that that's a, an extra meeting for church council. Uh, this week. And then finally, our last announcement is that um, the Sunday school, all persons interested in Sunday school, teachers, helpers, assistants, uh, substitutes, parents, anybody who would like to hear about our plan for Sunday school, please plan to stay for a few moments uh, beginning 11 o'clock in McConnell Hall. Uh, Susan will be there to um, share with you the information about Sunday school and also offer you the opportunity to vote on or choose the curriculum that we'll be using as uh, there are some options for that. And so this is a, a way to, to um, participate and to um, help us to plan for a great year of Sunday school. Uh, we look forward to getting back to, uh, to the way things were. Um, so please stay for a few moments if you're able this morning at 11 o'clock. If you can't stay and would like it, that information, please uh, be in touch with Susan. She's sitting right over there. Um, you can email her or uh, um, see her and uh, we'll be happy or call the church office and we'll connect you uh, whatever is the easiest way for you to to ask the questions so um, those are the announcements and now we'll stand and share in our closing hymn uh, which is uh, victory in jesus number 370 uh, which is uh, really the the hope that we have in dealing with these seven deadly sins uh, that our victory is in jesus he gives us victory over all the things that that we struggle with and thanks be to God for Jesus who came to give his life for us.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to come once again to your table, the table that reminds us and where we experience your love, your grace, and the victory that we have in Jesus. We thank you that he came to give his life, that we would be victorious over pride and greed and envy and gluttony and anger and sloth and lust and all the sin that we deal with day to day. We thank you that you've taken that sin and guilt away from us through the gift of his life. So help us now to go forth and to live as your people, sharing your love and grace with others in whatever ways we're able. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.